till en uh, lång dag med intressanta föredrag. Så då ska jag bara sätta igång med att få introducerat uh, de första föredragshållarna och de kommer uh, från USA. Så jag ska slå över engelsk för att presentera dem. So, uh, hello and welcome to our international guests, uh, David Tuller and uh, Maidy Horning. Uh, already see in the chat box that uh, David is uh, present, so that's good. Uh, it's a very early morning for both of you in the US. Uh, so, David Tuller will be first up. Uh, he's a senior fellow in public health and journalism at UC Berkeley Center for Global Public Health in California. Uh, he received a Doctor of Public Health degree in 2013 from Berkeley. And he has worked for 10 years as a reporter and editor at the San Francisco Chronicle. And he has written about public health and medical issues for publications like the New York Times and Health Affairs and a lot of other publications as well. Um, and since uh, 2015, he has been investigating some of the scientific controversies related to ME, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. He has a widely read blog series, which is called Trial by Error, Trial by Error and he has also authored and co-authored uh, peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals about the issues he's investigating. And today, he will talk about some of the things he's been dealing with for the last few years. So, David, the screen is yours. You've got uh, 30 minutes. Uh, okay. Everybody can hear me? Yes, I can't hear anybody. Hello? Okay. Uh, yes, you can hear me. Okay, great. Thanks. I'm very technologically challenged, so this is a little bit difficult for me. Okay, so basically I was asked to talk about sort of the biopsychosocial approach to um, CFS, as uh, it tends to be called by people who use the biopsychosocial approach, and uh, PACE, music therapy, and CBT, and other crap. Um, so I just want to say that I don't think the biopsychosocial approach overall is crap for everything, but I do think that in this domain, uh, the people that are, we're talking about, um, or that I've been challenging, whose research I've been challenging, basically focus on the psychosocial parts and forget about the bio part. Uh, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about the PACE trial, which was how I first got into this, and then uh, a, a study in Norway that was published last year on CBT and music therapy to prevent uh, chronic fatigue after, um, uh, or and a chronic fatigue syndrome, essentially after glandular fever in adolescents. And then a little bit, if I have time, which I probably won't about the lightning process, because I know there's a study coming up there, uh, possibly. Um, okay. So basically, um, this is who I am. Uh, I have crowdfund, um, uh, uh, mainly from patients. So I, that would be considered a conflict of interest, but that's, uh, there it is. And, uh, let's see. Um, Okay, how do I move the, okay, so, um, oh shit, hold on, hold on, how do I get my previous slide? Um, great, okay, thanks. So all of this research, the, the big question for a lot of this research uh, is that these are mainly um, open label studies, meaning they're unblinded, so both patients and the uh, um, uh, therapists or the people doing the, the, the clinicians know who's in what arm, and they all rely on subjective outcomes, in other words, self-reported outcomes. And that's a known recipe for bias, because basically if you know what study you're in, if you know what arm you're in, and you know that arm is supposed to help you because you're being told that, uh, and then you're asked at the end, do you feel better? Then of course you're more likely to say you feel better at the end of that than the ones who didn't get it. So all these studies, the PACE trial, the music therapy study, um, they all tend to have um, also uh, objective measures, some of them, but when the objective measures don't work, they forget about them and then they just say, oh, it's a success based on sort of squishy uh, subjective measures. That's what happened in PACE, so let's see what happened. Um, next slide would be this one, okay. So basically, here's the big questions about PACE. I, I didn't get into this because I have ME or because I, you know, I have a family member, I do have a friend. So I had known about um, ME and CFS, but the thing about, about 
uh, paste came out and I just was so fascinated by how awful it was. And when I checked with my epidemiology colleagues and so on at Berkeley, um, uh, you know, they all said, this is really, this, this trial is just horrible, you should write about it. Uh, so I started looking into it, and basically the big questions are, many people had met the outcome thresholds at baseline, um, and that's not really appropriate. You can't really call that science. Um, patients were simultaneously disabled and recovered, uh, it, you know, on some of the measures in the trial. That's also not allowed. And why is being defended by uh, UK and Norwegian and other academic and medical establishment? It's obviously a ridiculous trial, and as it's used at Berkeley now as a case study in epidemiology classes of how not to conduct clinical research. So I don't really understand why it's even controversial to talk about it as a bad trial, but apparently it is. Okay, next slide. Uh, which one is that? Uh, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, here. Okay, that's the next slide. Okay, just to say one thing, the the um, Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine in the U.S., in 2015 reviewed all the literature and declared that MECFS is a serious, chronic, complex, and multi-system disease that frequently and dramatically limits the activities of affected patients. Uh, it rejected the idea that this was a psychiatric disorder or that it was caused by deconditioning or that it was uh, somehow people had false illness beliefs as sort of a prime aspect of the condition. And so the report focused away just from fatigue and focused on post-exertional malaise uh, which it renamed exertion intolerance, uh, and so that was sort of a big uh, development. Um, after that, let's see, uh, so PACE was set up to be the definitive trial, um, they called it that themselves, the investigators, of CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, uh, and this is a bespoke, a specific kind of cognitive behavior therapy uh, for uh, to deal with chronic fatigue syndrome, not just generic that you might have for cancer or other uh, kinds of illnesses. And then graded exercise therapy, which we all know. Uh, again, so it was an open label. It had subjective outcomes. Uh, they did have objective outcomes, which failed to match the uh, success of the subjective outcomes. So they basically dismissed their own objective outcomes as irrelevant and not objective after all. Uh, they used the Oxford criteria, which is six months of unexplained fatigue and no other symptoms required. And so that tends to conflate chronic fatigue, which is a symptom of many, many illnesses and conditions, uh, and uh, a clinical entity that we would call ME or ME-CFS. Uh, 641 participants for trial arms, uh, CBT, GET, adaptive pacing therapy, which was kind of an operationalized form of pacing, and then uh, a, a standard a special, a specialist medical care, which was just kind of uh, treatment as usual. Uh, these were the principal investigators, my best friends. And the theory was that basically all the system, the, the symptoms are not due to anything organic, but well, they're due to not an underlying patho, uh, pathophysiology, but they're due to deconditioning because patients have dysfunctional cognitions about their illness and they just stay home and in bed and don't get any activity. And so they're deconditioned. And so basically they're really out of shape. Um, so let's see, uh, oh, whoops. Okay, so the PACE trial, the first results were published in 2011 in The Lancet. They fo that focused on improvement, uh, but they sort of muddied the waters by having a commentary that claimed people recovered. Um, in 2013, they had a very bogus recovery paper. Uh, they claimed that 22% recovered uh, uh, with the CBT and GET. Uh, I wrote, a, I got into the thing with a 15,000 word investigation um, on virology blog in October uh, five, six years ago, five and a half years ago. Uh, the next year, a tribunal ordered uh, Queen Mary University of London to turn over raw data. Um, that data was released and then there was reanalyses done. Uh, a psychology in um, a BMC Psychology published in March uh, 2018. It basically um, rebutted all the pace, main PACE findings. And basically, they engage in dramatic outcome switching, meaning that they change their um, uh, the way they measured wanted to measure things after the fact, uh, after they collected data. And so, basically, they had no findings, or basically very marginal findings, that would suggest it was a placebo, or you know, there really wasn't a real effect. Uh, and those it, those basically, um, when they changed all their uh, way, they did everything. 
they turned they got marginally better findings, which turned into the pace that we know, which they reported as that it was effective. Um, and also, they published a follow-up paper two and a half years later, uh, a two and a half year follow-up, and basically there were no long-term benefits uh, from it at all. The other groups, the groups were all the same at the end. Um, okay. So this was my initial um, thing that I wrote about it. I sort of got into it because I, I kept reading what patients were writing about it, and I thought, well, that just sounds really weird. And so I started reading it, and I. I also well actually yes patients were right you really could be you know be recovered on an outcome measure at baseline it made no sense you know they actually did do this and they did do that and so I started looking into it and I spent about a year and then I wrote this um, uh, I guess expose and at uh, fifteen thousand words and that got me involved so anyway what are the main there's many many things I could you could write a whole book about the pace things wrong with the pace trial. But I'm just going to focus on a couple of things. Um, one is the, the outcome switching. Uh, two is that they really don't have any legitimate informed consent, uh, in my understanding of how one gets informed consent. And so it's basically, they don't have consent for any of their uh, participants, which is a big deal. Um, and as I said, the study design, uh, those are things that I think make it really retractable. It should be retracted on that basis. The fact that it's a bad study design uh, uh, open label and subjective outcomes, and that they use a, a criteria which conflates chronic fatigue and chronic fatigue syndrome. I think that's bad science, but I don't think that that would warrant retraction in and of itself. But I do think that the outcome switching and the lack of legitimate informed consent are both forms of, of, of you know, likely forms of research misconduct, and really the study should be looked at in that light. Um, Okay, so the outcome switching in pace was very dramatic. And outcome switching is something that you're not supposed to do. It basically, when you do a study, you basically set out in the beginning uh, what you're going to do, and that's in your what you call your protocol. And then you register the study and say you're going to do X, Y, Z. Um, you know, basically, pace wrote a protocol. But then when you actually look at the final published papers, the outcomes that they publish are completely different from the ones that they actually promised you uh, in, in the protocol, or at least how they, how they assess the findings from the measures that they have are completely different than what they promised you. Why would they do something like that? Well, you would do something like that if you think that your findings possibly are not going to be very good, and you think that if you change everything, you might get better findings. It's very clear that everything they did uh, ended up weakening uh, the measures. So in other words, more people would appear to be improved or recovered. So there's many ways that they did this. But one of the, the, the most striking way, actually, um, is that they did it in such a way that in, in for two of their main measures, and particularly for their main measure of physical function, which was a questionnaire called the SF36, uh, they did it in quite a dramatic way so that you could be recovered or imp significantly Im improved or recovered on that measure, um, even if you got worse from where you were at the beginning. Uh, so here's what happened. Um, when they started the trial uh, on let's this SF36, it's a scale that goes from uh, zero to 100. So zero means basically you're a corpse. 100 is you're perfect. Uh, in terms, it's 20 questions, you know, can you do this? Can you, you know, do this? Can you lift bags or, you know, whatever, 20 questions about what you physically can do. Um, and normal, you know, people would generally score, even people with some disability, 80, 85, 85 would be a, you know, cutoff for, for, for being healthy. So when they started off the trial, um, they started off that uh, you had to score 65 or below to prove that you were disabled enough to be in the trial. That's reasonable because 65 is pretty disabled on this score. So if you scored 65 or below, you could be in the trial as disabled. When they started the trial, they had uh, listed that um, a, 70, a score of 75 uh, would be considered an improvement. In other words, you'd moved up 10 on that measure. And a score of 85 would be considered recovery for physical function. Well, by the time they published um, the papers, um, they had dropped <laughs> the measure for what they considered improvement to be 60. Uh, it's complicated. They called that to be within the normal range, but I'm not going to explain that right now. But anyway, that was what they used to measure improvement was 60. And also that was what they used to measure recovery when they published a paper on recovery a couple of years later. So what does that mean? It sounds a little bit insane. And in fact, it is. You could actually be disabled at, at 65 uh, uh, um, and get into the trial. You could get worse on physical function uh, and score 60. 
but you could still be considered recovered for physical function. And that meant you could be considered recovered for the whole trial if you met the other metrics for recovery. So here's a trial in which you can actually get worse, worse, we're saying worse, on the main uh, measure of physical function and still be counted as recovered in the trial um, because the outcome threshold is lower than the entry requirement. Now, this is just not um, okay. And this is obvious from the papers, but we, we didn't know until they were required to release some of the data that they didn't release whether this actually happened in reality. What we found, what was found out by patients who then filed for uh, through a freedom of information request is that 13% of the uh, participants had already met that um, physical function outcome threshold at baseline. So in other words, they were already recovered for physical function when they went into the trial as the, the data were redefined after the fact. So that's a little bit of a bizarre anomaly. And I've never seen a clinical trial myself in which people were recovered at a measure in the beginning. And I've asked the Lancet, I've asked the PACE authors repeatedly in the beginning when they you know, seem to be open to possibly exchanging messages with me, uh, how, have they, could they identify other clinical trials in which this, this was the case? And I, as far as I can, no, nobody can. So that's a very, very bizarre thing that you can't do. Um, there were multiple examples of this kind of outcome switching in pace. And um, every single measure uh, that they w had the effect of weakening their measures, which of course makes it easier to report success. Um, the way they did this really beggars belief. And it's, it, it, it's quite shocking, actually. I was, I, I, you know, my colleagues at Berkeley just were absolutely astonished at some of the shenanigans here. And I think it is quite disturbing that this past peer review and that it's stood the test of time, apparently. Uh, Lancet still thinks it's a great trial. Um, okay. Uh, oh, let's, I'm going backwards. Uh, I did this. Okay. Okay, what were the answers to their outcome switch when I raised these in my thing? Um, we changed the outcome measures before seeing the results, so they were pre-specified. This might fly if it was a blinded trial uh, and if the measures were objective, so you really couldn't tell what was going on. Um, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, it, one of the problems with a blinded, unblinded trial relying on subjective outcomes is that you don't actually need to see any results um, before they, uh, b b you, you can see trends if you're the, one of the principal investigators and you're not stupid, you can actually usually see trends in the results before you actually see any data because you know who's in what group and you know who's doing better or who's feeling better, who's saying they're feeling better. So it doesn't matter when they change their outcome measures, uh, whether it was before or after, it was after they, <laughs> after they collected data uh, and after they, people were having results. So it's not okay. Um, they decided, uh, one of the things they said, they decided their original measures were too stringent. Well, if you can decide that after you write a protocol, then there's no point in writing a protocol. I mean, it makes no sense. You had two years to decide what your measures were for your protocol or however long you worked on it. And then after the fact, you say, oh, we have other measures. We like those better. That doesn't work that way. That's not how science works. Um, they say it doesn't matter that people were recovered on key variables, but we had other recovery measures as well. So I say this is a response from outer space. This is absurd. You can't be recovered on any variable just because you have others, you know, much less one of your two main, uh, both of your principal measures to get into the trial. Uh, so that answer is totally ridiculous. And then they complain that when people reanalyzed it, they said that they tweaked uh, the outcomes to make the results look worse. So in other words, um, when people who did the reanalysis, and I was uh, an author, a co-author of the reanalysis paper, they were saying that we, we tweaked it to make it look worse, when in fact, the, the reality is that the people reanalyzing just untweaked what they had already tweaked without really sufficient justification. Uh, they tweaked their findings when they made them look better by changing all their outcome measures. So the reanalyzers re just untweaked everything that had been tweaked without sufficient justification. Um, okay, so um, so here's the problem with the informed consent. Um, basically, in 2005, uh, or when they did when they started enrolling people, it was still a little squishy as to what you had to disclose to participants in trials or not uh, by you know prevailing standards in U.S. and U.K. and so on. Um, they should have just so basically one of the issues with with the pace investigators is that they the three main investigators have long-standing ties to disability insurance companies 
um, as well as uh, Department of Health and Welfare and other agencies, um, but particularly disability insurance companies, um, who are interested in limiting disability payouts. And when people come for chronic fatigue syndrome, they don't want to pay out disability for uh, or, or um, you know disability payments for many years or social welfare, what what, what the term would be. Um, and so they want to find a way to say, no, you just need short-term therapy and you can get back to work. So of course, um, the PACE authors who advocate for cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy for 10 or 12 sessions and should get you right back there, uh, reconditioned and you know uh, readjusted your cognitively, ready to work. So they've had longstanding ties promoting these ideas. And the PACE trial was supposed to be kind of the big trial to prove that it worked, even though they were already doing it for quite a long time. So um, they certainly had conflicts of interest, uh, apparent, both apparent and real. Um, because they were making, uh, having reputational, uh, uh, presumably, and financial benefits from this advice they were giving uh, based on what they were testing in the PACE trial. So anyway, in the PACE trial, the authors uh, in their protocol, they promised to declare, uh, adhere to the Declaration of Helsinki, which was a, um, it's a human rights document, and it basically is about um, human subjects research. And at the time of the PACE trial, when they were doing their consent forms, it very explicitly said, researchers must tell prospective participants about any possible conflicts of interest and any institutional affiliation. So that's any possible conflicts of interest. That's a fairly broad category. And so basically the PACE principal investigators, again, have apparent and real conflicts of interest in terms of their relationships in promoting these rehabilitative therapies to insurers especially, and again, to some government agencies. Um, but this was not included in the consent forms. Uh, so what were their answers to the lack of informed consent? When I, again, I raised this in my uh, investigation in 2015, and so these were some of their answers. Um, we told the journals about our possible conflicts of interest, and this is true. If you look at The Lancet and the other journals where the PACE studies were published, it says, you know, underneath it says uh, uh, their disclosures. but. That's not what the Declaration of Helsinki is about. Um, they also said insurance companies were not involved in the study. That's a problem. Um, that's not the definition of conflict of interest, it, it, whether they were involved in the study or not. That has nothing to do with whether you have conflict of interest that you need to report. And then they said only three out of 19 investigators did work for insurance companies. And I was like, what does that have to do with anything? So actually four of them had ties, not three. But so what? You tell, <laughs> you disclose them anyway. Is it is it? You disclosed those three, and you were the three principal investigators, or the four. The three, the three principal investigators all had ties. So these were, again, non-responses. Um, and so going around this is pace an example of research misconduct. Um, these were uh, the, the Medical Research Council in the UK. Uh, these are definitions. Misrepresentation of data, for example, suppression of relevant findings and or data, or knowingly, recklessly, or by gross negligence, presenting a flawed interpretation of data. I would say that, yes, that seems to qualify. Um, same look at the last one, falsification, which is the National Institutes of Health definition, manipulating research materials, equipment, or processes, or changing or omitting data or results such that the research is not accurately represented in the research record. I would say that when you omit data that indicates that 13% of your participants uh, had already met your outcome threshold at baseline or were already recovered on that measure at baseline, that that is <laughs> omitting significant data that shows it would be the research is not accurately reflected in the research record. So I think that PACE could qualify as research misconduct. I don't adjudicate these things, but that's my own personal opinion. Um, Conclusions, okay, we've, we've gone through these basically. Uh, they've always gone around accusing patients of being anti-science, and we see the same thing going on in Norway, that people who insist on proper science are being called anti-science, like climate change deniers. In this case, the PACE authors and their colleagues are, are, the, are the climate change deniers and not the patients. And again, the best use of PACE, as well as the next one I'm going to talk about for a few minutes, the music therapy a study is as a pedagogical tool, which is how it's used at Berkeley. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about this study that came out last year, which was very interesting. Um, it was a Norwegian study. It was about cognitive behavior therapy plus music therapy as a way to stave off um, 
chronic fatigue uh, after a bout of glandular fever in adolescence. So uh, again, another study, uh, um, uh, open label, uh, you know, uh, unblinded, obviously. Uh, it's hard to blind music therapy. Um, uh, so I just want to say, when you blind, it's, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, unblinded studies are okay, but you have to have some objective measures to go along with it. You can't just rely on unblinded studies and object and, and, and uh, uh, subjective findings. It's just, it, it's just too much bias in that that you can't figure out. So this was published in BMJ Pediatrics Open, which is pretty high profile. Um, the research question was, it can CBT it prevent chronic fatigue uh, post-glandular uh, fever? Um, and they were working with adolescents with glandular fever and the half got music therapy. They identified patients who had gone through glandular fever and signed up for the study and half got the CBT for music therapy with CBT combined with music therapy and half got something else. Um, just basically treatment as usual. Oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, so first, let's point out that we have a broken peer review system. So basically, BMJ Open is, as it says, it's an open uh, journal, which which tends to mean that it has open peer review, um, which means that you can see the peer review. Uh, you can read the peer reviews when they post the study, they post the peer reviews. This is actually an interesting thing, especially in cases like this, where you have peer reviewer number two saying, I haven't read, quote, beyond the abstract. So basically, he peer reviewed the abstract, and he had some comments on the abstract, but then he said, I haven't read anything else. Um, so you know, why did he peer review it? Why did he agree to peer review it? It's a little odd, but at least he, the, well, he, it was a he, um, at least he was honest and he said that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. Now, if you're a journal editor and you see that, you don't say, oh, never mind. I guess it didn't need to be read a second time. Uh, you say, no, we need to find another peer reviewer. That's not what happened at BMJ Open, uh, which is supposed to have a rigorous process. Um, they basically published it anyway, and they didn't seem to... Have a, have a problem with this, or they didn't notice it. Uh, it's not really clear. Um, in any event, you, you can't publish a paper like this on, with, without a full peer review. I mean, you can, obviously they did, but it's a little bit shocking, or it's quite shocking, actually. Um, and let's see. Um, so, but that even wasn't the main concern. One of the things that, <laughs> the main concern, the thing that was quite bizarre, was that this called itself a feasibility trial. It was published as a feasibility trial or a feasibility study, which means you're doing a small pilot thing to look at with small numbers. Um, uh, oh, with, with small numbers and your, um, uh, uh, and then you're going to see if it's if it's feasible to do a big trial. So it's not supposed to be um, the final you know thing. You're supposed to be able to get another chance to do a trial. So when they published this was published as a feasibility trial, meaning um, they had already always planned it to be a feasibility trial, and then they were going to do a bigger trial. Um, so. The problem was when you look at the protocol, it actually always was a full scale trial. It was never a feasibility trial. They designed it as a fully powered trial, but they just had bad results. Um, so they sort of it got turned into a feasibility trial and in which they asked for further funding for, to further study the problem. So you can't get bad results in a feasibility study in, in a trial and then say, oh, it wasn't a real trial after all, it was just a feasibility trial. That could also be considered research misconduct, and it's very bizarre. So um, another, con several other concerns, again, one was that, um, again, we had some post hoc uh, stuff going on here. They put post-exertional malaise, uh, it wasn't in the protocol and it wasn't in the trial registration, but it somehow appeared in the paper and it appeared as a positive thing in the conclusion. So it's not really clear how that got in there. Um, the primary outcome was objective. It was the average number of steps per day people took. Um, Surprisingly to the authors, I suppose, uh, both groups, uh, oh, well, that's not, both groups um, got worse. Both groups got worse. They walked less. That should be walked less. They walked less steps at the end than the beginning, but the intervention group did even worse than the non-intervention group. Um, it wasn't statistically significant, but they did even worse uh, than the non-intervention group. And that wasn't even mentioned in the conclusion. Then finally, they had a recovery measure that they came up with, but doesn't even include the primary outcome. So it's hard to say how you have a recovery if it doesn't include your primary outcome. So that was problems with that. Um, <coughs> a patient 
who was very smart, uh, wrote to the journal and complained about this. And I had also followed up with a, a letters, multiple letters, um, maybe half a dozen to the journal to complain uh, and to uh, sort of nudge them to get going on, on doing this. What they ended up doing was very unsatisfactory. They did a, what they call a, replace, uh, a retract and replace. So getting retraction is a pretty big deal. So that was good. But they replaced it essentially with the exact same thing, except um, they just didn't refer to it as a feasibility trial. And instead of actually taking blame, instead of actually putting the, <laughs> the blame where it belongs, which is both on the authors and on the journal for not getting that, um, they completely blame themselves for miscommunication uh, 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 about that and that it was their fault. So they didn't blame, uh, put any responsibility on the authors uh, from Norway for this, which is really ridiculous because uh, the, doc the documentary record shows that it was clearly um, the fault of, <laughs> of the investigators for not telling the truth. Uh, and BMJ is sort of cover seems to be covering up for them, in my opinion. Um, they still included post-exertional malaise. Uh, uh, in the in the conclusions and the main, main outcome was still not mentioned in the conclusions um, and there was no mention uh, in their notice of retraction about the failure of the peer review or what they were doing to fix that so it's still crap and the findings are still presented in a completely misleading manner and I am not happy with the resolution and that's basically the end of my talk I, 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 I will say uh, these are my thanks um, I will say about the lightning process just for a minute, if I can, that I know that um, uh, there's a decision coming up on that. I have quote with, had an opinion piece, I guess, in Dog Blaudet about um, uh, the lightning process. Um, what, what I want to say is that, you know, the lightning process and anything like that and CBT and all these, anything, I don't object to people doing things like the lightning process if they want to. What I object to is people being um, essentially told that this is a, you know, treatment that they will get better. And many people have the experience. Uh, we do, you know, have reports. Many people get, have the experience that they feel blamed afterwards uh, because they didn't get better like the lightning process tells them that how they're supposed to and it's supposed to work. And so, again, the, the testimonials, the things, it basically promises you, if you look at the sites and everything else, that you're going to get better. And, you know, you can do these things, but it shouldn't be done based on fake science or scientific claims that aren't valid. You know, if people want to do it, that's fine. But don't do it based on, you know, uh, promises that are based on, on, on really flawed science. And so I've come to the end of my talk. Thank you, David. That was a nice way to kick off a scientific conference with. Uh, Thank you. I hope I didn't talk too quickly. <laughs> was um, to, to kick off a scientific conference with a harsh critique of uh, science. That's uh, that's a nice way to start. Okay. Thank uh, you. So we're gonna move on to Mady Horning now.